Hi, and welcome to the Unreal Engine News and Community Spotlight. Julian Trutman and Nick Cooper ditched the safety of their positions here at Epic to dive into indie life to create Soundfall, a vibrant and stunning, fast-moving action game that takes a player's own music and sets it as the soundtrack and tempo to their adventure. Syncing bass beats with gratifying gunplay isn't a feat easily achieved, however, so Drastic Games had to go to considerable lengths to make it all work. Since taking the leap in August, they've launched the game into crowdfunding on FIG and successfully smashed their goal within 24 hours, are now focusing on stretch goals. Dive into our interview with Julian to learn about the perils of going indie, the passion of creating something you love, and the power of Unreal. The Soul Calibur series has long been one of the most respected fighting, respected fighting game franchises in the industry, with revamped modern graphics and a fighting system that is as deep as it is accessible. It's no surprise that the recently released Soul Calibur 6 has garnered rave reviews. For many, it's the best Soul Calibur yet, and the project was made possible in part by UE4. To learn more about how Bandai Namco delivered such a fan favorite, we interviewed Soul Calibur 6 producer Morohiro Okubo, in which he shares the importance of a responsive fighting system and the exploration of Soul Calibur's unique world. While there are many VR shooters, Evasion by developer Archiac incorporates numerous elements that make it stand out. The sci-fi space shooter offers an action-packed campaign with four playable character classes, innovative combat, full-body inverse kinematics, and high production values coupled with online co-op gameplay. Evasion does all of this with a level of polish that is rare in a VR game made by an indie studio. We got a chance to interview several members from the team to learn more about how they were able to create one of VR's most compelling shooters. Read the full story in the article linked below. Last week, we announced our final round of NVIDIA Edge recipients. We're excited for Vaki Games' King's Hunt, a third-person online multiplayer action game that combines tower defense and real-time strategy with hack and slash. Also recognized as Home Vision VR's Brody Ranch, the team brings simple, flat floor plan plans to life with their gorgeous renderings of 3D environments. And last up is part shooter, part racing game Diesel Guns, in which players enjoy dynamic, fast-paced action, intuitive controls to designed to allow focus on gameplay and a well-balanced arsenal to take out enemy combatants. We've been honored to celebrate so many outstanding projects over the life of the NVIDIA Edge program. We, uh, you can see many of them in our NVIDIA Edge highlight video, and many thanks to all that participated. As Unreal Engine continually evolves, we often release experimental and early access features for devs to explore. As these names imply, these features are not yet production ready, but provide an opportunity to experience and contribute to various features while still in development. With this in mind, it's important to have a clear understanding of what both early access and experimental mean for your project. Early access features give you the opportunity to learn how they work, plan your pipeline, and create test content. Do use caution when using these features in production. They're still working to get to shipping quality, performance, stability, and platform support. We do support backward compatibility for assets, and the APIs for these features are stable. Features are sometimes made available in an experimental state, so you can try them out, provide feedback, and see what we're planning. We do not recommend shipping projects with experimental features. Please keep in mind that we do not guarantee backward compatibility for assets created at the experimental stage, the APIs for these features are subject to change, and we, we may remove entire experimental features or specific functionality at our discretion. Previously, we shared the story of Vox Populi Productions' switch to UE4 for their 2018-2019 season of ICI Le Flac. Now, they've released a white paper, ICI Le Flac Broadcast Quality Within a Tight Timeline, which you can read to learn more about their pipeline and how they're turning around half-hour animated shows in under a week. Dive in using the link below. And the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences has awarded Epic Games with the first Technology and Engineering Emmy for Unreal Engine in the 2017-18 category, 3D Engine Software for the Production of Animation. We couldn't be more thrilled with this recognition, and our sincere thanks go to all of the creatives around the world using Unreal Engine for live broadcast, virtual production, and mixed reality programming. We look forward to celebrating the achievements of the entire Unreal Engine community at the 70th Annual Technology and Engineering Emmy Awards Ceremony on April 7th, 2019, in association with the National Association of Broadcasters at the NAB Show in Las Vegas.
onto our weekly Karma Earners. These folks are answering all the questions on Answer Hub. So many thanks to Shadow River, Thompson N13, Akinarts, Mighty Enigma, Tour, Endelchen, Maisie Mods, Sertak Ogan, and Death Ray. You all rock. Our first community spotlight this week is a project called Experience Colorblindness. So if you've ever wondered how colorblind people see the world, you can now experience it for yourself. Let yourself be guided in a narrative mode, explore three immersive environments, and you can try fruit shopping or painting. And color vision tests are even included. Next up is Airborne, created by Taylor Shorten. It's a beautiful scene built in approximately six months based on a concept by Simon Kopp. Just a really gorgeous scene overall, a lot of wonderful elements included, and stylistically, just a cool, cool piece. Our final spotlight this week is VR Range, a close quarter battle game. You'll shoot, boom, and blast your way onto the firing range, fight your way across a wide range of environments, taking advantage of a library of fully interactive weapons. You can pick your weapon, lock and load your magazines, and tear your targets apart. You'll compete on their online leaderboards for the top spot as you battle your way through your close quarter combat simulation environments. Thank you for joining us for our news and community spotlight. Hi, and welcome to our Unreal Engine live stream. I'm your host, Amanda Bott. With me, we have the wonderful Gwen Frey, creator of Kinds. So thank you so much for joining us. It's good to be here. Returning is Jay, lead animator. Hello. He's been on a number of uh, streams with us. And fellow community manager, Tim Slater. Hey, everybody. So today, we're really excited to have you here and kind of talk about Kind, which you're building entirely in Blueprint, correct? Yes, that's correct. And so um, kind of how, as a solo indie developer, you're building a game purely in Blueprints, and but by trade, you're an animator. Uh -huh. So you kind of want to give a... Give them all a bit of your history and background. Sure, absolutely. Um, this is a camera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, my name is Gwen. I was um, I started out as a character animator and a character rigger. I worked on Marvel Heroes Online and a couple of MMOs out in, in San Francisco. That's awesome. Moved to Boston to work on Bioshock Infinite and spent several years there. Made Bioshock Infinite and the DLC for that. I'm sure, that was quite an adventure. It was fun. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a lot of stories there. <laughs> and then um, about five years ago, I, uh, I left. Well, Irrational Games shut down, and mm -hmm. uh, we founded an indie studio in Boston. We It was called The Molasses Flood. Mm -hmm. We shipped our first title, The Flame and the Flood. That came out, I yes. think, a couple years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been there for a while, and I recently, after that shipped, I kind of like started experimenting with different prototypes. We were thinking about what we wanted to do next, and I, one of the prototypes I kind of fell in love with, it was this little puzzle game, and I kept <laughs> working on it at home for... Um, ever since basically yeah. and slowly over time i've started spending more and more time working on it and then i uh I, just taking over your it's, life <laughs> it did it reached a point where i stopped i didn't have time anymore like i wasn't sleeping i was working on oh, no. i was working on this like two games at the same time and so oh. um i uh i left um we brought the molasses flood things are going really well there mm -hmm. i hired a replacement and i've left there and i founded a new studio uh to just work on kind it's nice. this puzzle game i've been making do we want to show the trailer? Yeah, do you so want to show us the trailer? Oh, yeah, this is a trailer from March. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's kind. That's my baby. That's my <laughs> that's awesome. I love the character, like his movements. He just he feels so alive, even though he's a robot. <laughs> that's the idea. So it's about these three little machines, the dream of being musicians, and it's mm -hmm. about them. Um, it's a narrative puzzle game. Uh, so there there is narrative that you don't really see there, but these three little musicians are forming a band and they struggle along the way and Aww. they're trying to find their big break. <laughs> um, that's really yeah. cool. Yeah, and that's all you like. 
you textures, environment, yeah, yeah. everything. Yeah. One uh-huh. one indie dev. That's amazing. From yeah. scratch. Yeah. No big deal. Yeah, no big deal. It's a Tuesday. <laughs> well, it's been, yeah. I've been picking at it for a while. Sure. Like, I didn't do this, like, in a weekend, right? <laughs> right. Like, that trailer was something I made. Um, I was working on that, and I showed that back in March. So that's actually kind of older art now at this point. But, yeah, it is a lot. It's a lot of work. That's for sure. So, you know, you started off as an animator, so I'm sure you went into this knowing how you're going to do the animation. But was there an aspect of developing this where you really had to learn some things like what was the biggest thing you had so when I first started it was like a prototype for I I was trying to I was playing around with different ideas at home and I wanted to come up with something initially because we were prototyping games but I also had this idea where I was like okay what if I make a a character like a bipedal normal character Mm -hmm. that instead of having walk cycles and stuff would push off of walls and would kind of tumble around the world Mm -hmm. and I think that was one of the initial prototypes that actually kind of eventually became this Um, Another thing, this was basically a mashup of a bunch of prototypes. I was also working, like I downloaded this, um, there's a, on the Unreal Marketplace, there's a a tactical uh, game for making like a tactics game, Mm -hmm. like a grid-based tactics game. And I was playing around like, I'm going to make a grid-based tactics game. (laughs) um, uh, So some of that wound up, basically it was a mashup, an amalgamation of a lot of those. And I have, ironically, you remember I used to... um, used to make these videos that were like time-lapse videos of development. Mm-hmm. So at the time when I was prototyping, I was recording my my screen. So I actually have some videos I can show you from like back. Yeah, that'd be awesome. You want to show yeah. like the first video? This is So this her. is showing you just developing. This is like... Yeah, like this is... Um, so like <laughs> this is... Oh, I remember this. This is when I thought I would make... One of the prototypes I was working on was like, what if there's these little machines? This is broken as shit. And they, uh, they like fight in like a in its 2d in this way Mm -hmm. (laughs) this was an idea i had at one point keep in mind this was all back when we were i was prototyping also things for the molasses floods so like what if this is when i mashed that up with the um the grid the grid based Mm -hmm. i i basically took what i learned from making that grid based tactical game and i like copied some of my coat my blueprints over and i i started working on this this is actually the closest thing to kind um so you can kind of see how I accidentally sort of stumbled into making a puzzle game. I've never made a puzzle game before. Like, I didn't intend that when I started. Mm-hmm. When I started, I was just playing around with a lot of things. And I'll, by the time I reached this point, I was very intentionally not working on anything that would have animation. Because I every day I would go to work, right? And I would mm-hmm. animate for the molasses flood. Like, right, so this is like a break from animating. Exactly. Yeah, so okay. this is like an animator trying to come up with something that's not animation. Mm-hmm. but. I still, I was having so much fun making prototypes and stuff. I kind of fell in love with scripting and blueprint scripting and just nice. fell in love with the idea of making this. So. Oh, that's very cool. That's yeah. Very cool. So do you want to show us the game itself or do you sure, want to yeah. hold it up? Um, yeah. So while you're doing that, we actually had a question come in um, from uh, partly uh, our comic says that they love games, but they're always stumped when it comes to creating a variety of accessible. Um, a cri- wow, I can talk today. That's fun. <laughs> Creating the variety of accessibility and the challenging puzzles necessary for a full game. Do you have any resources or anything that you would recommend? For making a full game versus for, making um, for making a puzzle game? Yeah, specifically they're asking if you have resources for puzzle design. Because they love making puzzle games, but mm-hmm. coming up with a variety of different levels. like. Yeah, I mean, I'll say I... So when I started this, I didn't know I was making a puzzle game, right? <laughs> um, so I didn't do any research whatsoever into that. Okay. And I um, I found out after the fact that uh, there is a community of people that make grid-based puzzle games specifically. Um, follow like Alan Hazelden on on Twitter. Uh, he has a really great Discord. Um, he's Drakneck. Uh, that Discord, I think, is a, a community of people who make um, puzzles and support each other and show each other's work and stuff. I'm I love that community. I think they're really cool. Now, would you repeat the name of it just? To have um, a second. Sure. Uh, the his name is Alan Hazelden. And Alan his, Hazelden. Yeah. Okay. And his uh his Twitter is Drakneck, and he has a Discord on there. Okay. Drakneck. Drak. Yeah. D R A K N. E or A. We'll dig it up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Someone will find it. Hopefully. Good yeah, luck, we'll get guys. there. Fine. We'll dig it up. Yeah, but they um, <laughs> they're uh, I, I'll admit, like they're. They're actually really extreme. Like they're designers. Uh huh. Like, I've never designed a game before either, right? Like I come from an art background. You're designing a game right now. I am. Uh, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> now I am. Uh, but there was a lot of learning. Like you have to keep in mind my first. Like I, sc- I basically made the game once, like enough puzzles for the game. Mm-hmm. Scrapped it. Started over. I can show you those. Like um, if you have like the second video, I'll show you. Or maybe you should. Yeah, we'll talk through that one. Get to the third, and I'll show you like. 
Oh, here's um, the second one. Oh, this is like when I was figuring out the art style and stuff. But um yeah, like when I when I first started out I, I was making all these like um I made a bunch of puzzles. Some of them were <laughs> set to music and some of them weren't, and basically all of them got scrapped and I, I got to where I was by making a lot of stuff that I ended up killing. Like this was one of the first this is about when I realized I should make a puzzle game. It was about when I started doing wow. this. Yeah. Um, like that right there looked complete, like a complete idea. Yeah. So this was about um, August last year was when I was here, I want to say. And then I knew I, I, knew I was going to take this seriously. I was going to make something, and I planned to kind of like put it on itch. Mm -hmm. And then I, that was when I started Twitch streaming development and, so, and backing up my streams to YouTube. So you can watch everything from about here onward. Like okay. you can watch me make it live on YouTube and on Twitch. Okay. Um, my Twitch is Dire Goldfish. Dire um, Goldfish, got it. Yes. Um, Sa same as your uh, Twitter handle. Right? Yep. yep. Dire yeah. Goldfish. Do you do you feel like streaming on Twitch helped one build up interest in your game as you were in development, and then I know sometimes our um, developers have experienced like other devs will come in and join mm -hmm. and actually help help in your development so they'll offer solutions yeah. as you go Do you, did you have that experience when you were streaming um a little bit there's a lot of different reasons to stream on twitch mm -hmm. um i'll say for me it was useful especially because i i was working a lot um it was useful to keep me focused sometimes okay because you can't alt tab to twitch like when you work a lot like i was working i'd work an eight hour day and then i'd go home mm -hmm. and it's easy to kind of get in the mindset where you take like a lot of micro breaks go over to twitter go over to facebook and right. stuff and so when you're streaming you can't do that and so actually for me it was more of a productivity tool oh. like people are watching I, and it's I, really clever it keeps you yeah there's only like five or six people <laughs> watching me back then especially. but they'll still hold you responsible right yeah <laughs> so, so like how many people do you have now or like what's your highest peak you've had watching oh i mean i it's still not that it's a small yeah. group like right. i i know everybody that like, the other thing is most of the people I wouldn't say I found a lot more followers on Twitch necessarily. Mm -hmm. Most of them came from Twitter, and yeah. like people I just happen to know or whatever. Cool. But so uh, yeah, it's like thirty to yeah. fifty people. Well, more like thirty, thirty-ish yeah, yeah. people usually. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, That's and cool. then like yeah. another thirty on YouTube or fifty on YouTube or something. But um, but yeah, like it's small, but it's it's cool. The um, the things like the the trailer get a lot more reach, for instance, because mm -hmm. that gets posted around. Or I took yeah. the um. I applied to something called the Left Field Collection, mm -hmm. which is like a, it's a really niche indie space at, at EGX. Okay. Um, and so I took the game, I got in, I got accepted, and they, they showed off the game, and I got to go watch a bunch of strangers play the game at EGX, cool. which is pretty sweet, yeah. Um, so that's that's been great, too, because I could see a lot of feedback. Right. Um, we went way off script. I have no idea where no, we were. That's fine. Everybody, oh, that's good. But yeah. Everybody in the Twitch chat's gonna come watch your stream next time. Oh, <laughs> thanks. So. Well, then now yeah. I'm gonna be keep nervous. Her, keep her like from yeah. distracting herself with other. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Keep, keep it used to. Time. It used to be a productivity tool, and now I'm just talking to people. The whole oh yeah. Time. Yep. You're not it getting is, anything done. Now. Yeah, it does become a lot of that. Like <laughs> it does actually. That's kind of cool. I like doing the Q and A stuff. But if you want, I can show Klein. Yeah. Sure. I think that's. Oops. I meant to skip this. This is a work in progress. Don't look at this. You hide, need a point? Hide this. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Well, while you're wanting no, to kidding. skip this, um, they were asking, uh, let's see, did they, did you, did they Unreal stream, did you use Toon Shading a while back help? Oh, did the Unreal stream on Toon Shading a while back give you help, or do you have your, did you build a lot of the Toon Shading? Like, how did you achieve your own Toon Shading effect? Oh, um, hmm. I mean, no, because that came out long after I established yeah. kind of what the game looks like. Let me um, let's just zoom in on this. This is all very work in progress. The environment's a work in progress. Don't hate me, guys. But um, <laughs> the how did I come up with it? I I just liked playing around with the materials. Mm -hmm. um, let me. I can show you the tune shader. Hold on. Let's take a look at it. Yeah, just open it up. Or we can. Oh, I've come back around if we want. No, it's all right. Let's just. Dive right in. Yeah. Okay. So for the materials. Sorry, I've got to like get used to this now. I know. The single monitor setup is yeah. <laughs> always the challenge on the stream. It's also like I can't read. It's so far away. <laughs> Do you see character materials? Oh, go. <laughs> I don't. Oh. Yeah. Are you sure you have character materials? Oh, wait, there. Uh, uh, is it shared just, character materials? Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, there it is. And that's Tina Matt Insta. Oh my god. Okay, here's the base character material, which all the others are like instances off of this. Um, I think it's pretty simple. So you just did a lot this of this right is here. cut. Yeah. yeah. So, this <laughs> basically, I was playing around with it. Uh, it looks like. Jesus, what have I done? <laughs> I have to refresh my memory because this is actually stuff I did a very long time ago. Oh, yeah. Okay. So what I ended up doing was I got the, um, I would find the, I would find the rotation of the character um, and I would find a vector that goes from the character to the camera. Mm -hmm. And I would, as you rotate the camera around, I'm dragging like a highlight around the, I'm scrolling a UV, okay. uh, which is scrolling the highlight around the character um and this, what this lets me achieve is things like i remember why i did this too i can show you on um, the bell of the player i could do a deep dive into this later because this is difficult to like talk about on the fly but um so like on the trombone for instance let's see if i can get this to work oh it's not auto activated damn it this is going to be hard for me to show right now. Oh, that's all right. But it's basically, right. get the basics of it. Yeah, there's yeah. just a highlight that scrolls around based on mm -hmm. a UV. Because oh, the UV okay. is um, wrapping, basically. Oh, that's great. Yeah. All right, here, let yeah, me show Yeah, we assume we probably can't deep dive into everything because this is what, two, <laughs> two, years of, two years of work? Yeah. Would you say? Yeah. Um, and it, it's just, I didn't know exactly what I'd show today. Because, yeah, yeah. uh, so we're, we are kind of doing it live. This is, this is for. So this is a grid-based puzzle game. <laughs> so your Obviously. goal is to get the sheet music, right? Yeah, yeah. you're mm -hmm. composing music as you go around. Yeah. Um, Have you, did you make all of the simple. music? Uh, no, that is the one thing. I um, I actually hired a composer I'm working with here named Mitchell in Boston, and he's been um, a huge part of the game is the music and how as you play through the world, the, the music builds. I've always loved working with musicians. That's very awesome. Yeah. I'm just going to cheat and show you different parts of the game because there's mm. a lot that's not in the trailer. <laughs> so there's the stuff you've already seen. Like there's, that's Rue. She eventually becomes an accordion. Oh, whoops. Actually, I went to the wrong spot. This is where she becomes an accordion. This is temporary. Please don't judge me. I'm still working on the art. <laughs> I love that style. So so she, so the characters develop into like more complex instruments over time? Mm -hmm. Like, um, here. And is that giving them, like, more abilities? Like, as they get complicated, they can do a couple more movement things? Yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah, check that out. So you got to, like, you can bang your head against the wall. You can fall off the world. Oh, no. <laughs> ah. I like that. that yeah. I, I won't call it a death screen, but that. Yeah, it's like a scribble. cool scribble effect. Yeah. yeah. Like an eraser. <laughs> now, do they do the characters have names? Oh, of course, yeah. So this is Rue. Rue. She's a sweetheart. She is six. She's kind of got multiple personalities. She's got like six personalities. Um, this is this is Quat. Let's talk about <laughs> Quat. Oh, let's introduce Quat. Quat's a bit of a Quat's a nerd. And uh, he's the the drum yeah. percussion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's a, he's a nerd. He's the kind of, like, the, the nerd in a bad way. Like. Pocket protector. Nah, like, he's the one where, like, if you're in a movie and you're, he'll be the one that's like. Oh. Like, say, he'll be like, no, physics don't work that way. <laughs> this movie, the logic is so incorrect. Like, he's the rules lawyer at your D&D &D game. That's awesome. It's Quat. It's like, God damn it, Quat, nobody likes you. <laughs> that's Quat. Um, and then there's Euler. Euler's, nice. Euler's a dreamer. I love that, that you have like stories and characters and personalities. Oh, of course. It's o fantastic. Euler, Euler gets into, he's rough. He like, he gets into jams sometimes. He's not, he has a hard time of it. Poor Euler. Well, he'll get there. Oh. Right. It just takes time. <laughs> yeah. I have faith in Euler. <laughs> so Euler's also, um, everybody likes Euler though, obviously. So they've kind of been asking, did you ever feel the need to, so you've, purely been developing a blueprint did you ever feel like 
you needed to extend to C++? Not yet. I haven't hit the wall yet. We'll see, right? Like, eventually. Um, but right now, I've been able to do everything in Blueprint, and it builds to... Because of that, the project file is really small. I don't mm -hmm. have to have it... Like, I can just use the latest editor. I don't have any drama anytime I want to upgrade to the latest engine, so yeah. that's kind of nice. And compiling is super fast and that sort of thing. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have... we There are a number of games that have shipped, you know, 100% in Blueprint, or even if it's, you know, the 95% where... Sometimes they need to add things if they're doing, you know, multiplayer stuff. But yeah. yeah, we um, released a free game. Was it Taffy Chicken or something? A while, a long time ago. That was all Blueprint. Yeah. But, um, I imagine yeah. once you're supporting consoles, that right. becomes a lot harder. I bet new hardware. Um, if you want to integrate like FMOD or something like that, mm -hmm. like some of the plugins, I imagine you'd have to get it. Um, like I did have to install Visual Studio at one point. Um, not to, uh, not because I was using any C++, but because it was the only way to use a one of the plugins okay because oh, like yeah. some plugins will even if it's com you, you don't mess with it at all when it comes time to package a build you'll have to have visual oh, studio yeah. install the libraries right. of it yeah yeah so that'll happen sometimes um but other than that this is all right so euler and rooster a little thing on the side say because they're in luck i was gonna say is there any sort of relationship y uh, yeah there's a it's bad for the band they it, shouldn't yeah, it is. <laughs> Not good for the band, but they. This is all temp art and stuff. They're on like a little boat together. Oh, so how cute! Figure out how to how to get get forward. Now, would this be a single player experience in that case, or? Yeah, this is all a single player yeah. game. Um, <laughs> what else happens? There's a lot of this kind of stuff. Later on, they uh, they can go dancing. No. Oh. And go. Let's see. That's a hard one. Give me a hard one. So, like, you know, when you're planning this stuff out, like, like obviously there's the mechanics of the level and the puzzle, but are you coming up with, like, the story first and then creating a puzzle to, like, help with that? It depends. Like, you, at first I was coming up with the puzzles, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I was kind of, the story was sort of coming together in my mind. I sort of knew what they want. I wanted them to be. I knew their names first. I okay. knew kind of, like, a lot of it's an insight. You, right. you get it. Euler, yeah. Quaternion, and mm -hmm. Rue, right? Like, yep. the world is built on a con... So if you exit out entirely, like, if you get all the way out of here, you'll see the world's built on a constant basis. There's a baseline that plays the entire time through. That's deep. You feel, oh, man. <laughs> oh, you just blew my mind. <laughs> Jay, it's set in Euclidean space. <laughs> <laughs> wow. This game was for you, Jay. Yeah. I made this for you, man. <laughs> this is what happens when animators make games. You get... <laughs> Actually, you know, it... It is true that animators, when you start, you think a lot about your character first. Oh, yeah. So, and it always, like, that's where animators start, is, like, who is this character before you what even start keyframing. So they, yeah. it, it seems like that approach has really helped this, this game. Yeah. yeah. So you can tell, like, for the solo, a lot of the levels that I first started out with became the, um, the levels where you're kind of learning, the tutorial levels. And then a lot of the stuff later on was, I... For instance, for this, I was like, I need to come up with something where they're on a boat. And I have this sliding tech. I want them to go on a date. What's cool? What if they're on a boat? <laughs> and so in a way, it, it's a bit of both. Or like, there's an option where they, if you do something wrong, they can go through like a breakup. And a lot of this isn't really in yet. But like, these are the, the levels where they're fighting. Um, <laughs> this is where Euler and Rue break up. But I knew I wanted that. And they're oh. like getting in each other's way. And it's like, oh. <laughs> so I, I knew I wanted to do something like that. Um, so you've blueprinted a breakup, is ultimately. Yeah, that's deep. Like yeah. they're they're getting in each other's way in yeah. the gameplay. Yeah. And this this goes on for a little while. They're like yeah. mad at each other. And as a, <laughs> and I sh I assume that the music accompanies that emotion oh, yeah. with it. Oh, I love yeah. it for this part particularly. I wish I could show you the music, but Mitchell did an incredible job. Or everywhere else in the game, the music's building up uh -huh. and gaining stems, whereas here it, you're losing stems, and uh, it's getting more and more bleak and. Oh, this looks great. Yeah, you put so much thought into this. This is great. I don't remember how to A beat this A lover's quarrel. That's awesome. So how did you come up? What made you decide on the name Kine? I'm not supposed to tell you because they said it's lame. Oh. I'm supposed to come up with a lie to tell people. What? Who told you it was lame? Uh, my friends. They're like, <laughs> you need to come up with a better name and also you're Aww. Just lame. <laughs> I think it's a great name. Oh, thank you. I just yeah. liked... I liked it. I thought it was a cute name. And also, I um, it's short for kinematic. Right. Yeah, you get it. There you go. It's the only. 
That's not that's not a dumb yeah. No, that's well, fine. You should question if those are your real friends. Yeah, I would find out. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember how to beat this one shit. Every now and then on stream I realize I can't beat my own game and then I feel weird about it. Yeah. Oh yeah, I got it. No, I don't. Well yes. it's one of those like you've seen so many different levels at that point, right? And yeah. trying to keep them all straight in the exact order of operations to get through each one. Yeah, exactly. I don't feel like there's any, like, oh. So, uh, you know, on my prior animation streams, you know, I always say, like, there's a way to do something, not the way to do something. Yeah. So I, I love getting into how, how do animators solve these issues. So can you go into some of the, the animation issues? Animation, or, yes, or, right. Yeah. I feel bad because I know. Or do you want to get into that yet? Do you want to show? No, we, we can. Okay. Like, I, I know, like, usually I talk about animation stuff in the past. Yeah. And this is a project I did where I started out with, like, I don't want to work on animation. I'm specifically not mm -hmm. going to animate anything. And so a lot of it's procedural. Like, awesome. the Very vast nice. majority of the, like, the movement system, all the way you move, it's mm -hmm. all, the bounce is all procedural. Um, there's things, oh, there's something I should show you. This is the coolest part of the animation system. But you won't understand it until I like. Yeah, yeah, show us, show us. Uh, I, I yeah, they're definitely curious to see your blueprints on like how you built the movements and your characters. Okay, absolutely. We'll get into that. Let me show you this first, though. Let me go to like, um, uh, would it be in the book or the scroll? I don't remember. It's, I think it's going to be in the book. Um, I'm trying to remember. There's I'm just trying to, th I think this would be a good map to show you because it's the easiest way to see it. Okay. So when, like, a character is on top of another character, mm -hmm. see how, like, she's kind of moving Oh, yeah, she that. takes oh, on cool. the motion of, yeah. Yeah. Or, like, um, in fact, how all of it is thinking is kind of unique. And that I realized one of the hardest things when you're working in these kinds of games, you mm -hmm. know this, is uh, animated attachments or getting two characters to animate at the same time. Yep. or getting them to work together is extremely difficult. Right. And usually it requires a lot of tech and I'm one person and I didn't want to like write a whole system for... Yeah, cause sometimes you get, by the time you've updated it, you're now a frame behind of, of yep. the other character or issues like that. So or just even if you get two characters to start an animation at the exact same time, making sure mm -hmm. they stay in sync necessarily so like right. they don't swim through each other or whatever. Or lining up two characters. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of drama there, right? Yeah. And here we have a situation where there's two idols and they need to suddenly sync up at the same time. And so what I do is I, I kind of bypass the entire typical animation. Like, a, I, I don't use typical animation blueprints. What I do is, um, let me grab, oh God, it's so far away, I can't see anything. I could read it to you. Yeah, where's I, got, I got LASIK a few years ago. <laughs> 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 all right, actually, I'll just search for Anna BP and then I'll see all of them. Okay, so like, inner. Appendage, body, body. yeah, so yeah. these are the only few. So all of the, so the characters are broken out down into the body, which is the yellow part that okay. you see, and the mm -hmm. appendages. And what matters is either way, if you look at the animation graph, if you look at what animations are playing, none of them are sequences. All of them, any, I just put down a sequence, I right click it, and I convert, like, first off, these are, these are actually animations, yes. So you put down an animation sequence, you right click it, and you convert it to a single frame animation. Are you familiar with this? Oh, where you can tell it at any given time in the animation? Yep, yeah, exactly. So, um, I mean, obviously, you made the engine. Like, are you familiar with this? Well, honestly, <laughs> I've, I've never used it. I have. It's, it's a weird niche thing that not yeah. many people use, right? So, oh, I think you like those. Okay, so what you can do is you can take an animation, you can right click it, and you can be like, I want a single frame from this animation. And that single frame is a variable. And so what I'm doing is I'm plugging the, um, at first it was game tick, now it's audio tick, because mm -hmm. I want everything to sync to the music. I just plug time into that variable. And I do that for absolutely every animation in the game. So every okay. single animation in the game, I'm, because they're all tied to the game tick, mm -hmm. they're always synced. So all of the idols are always synced. That is a very interesting way to approach that. That's great. <laughs> yeah. And so, like, and the limbs are different. Like, when I first started the game, I didn't know what the characters would be, and so I built mm -hmm. them as bodies with limbs, and limbs can change. And, like, 
a limb can go from being two units long to one unit long or two units long to zero units long and so forth. Right. And I didn't have any of the art done for that. Um, and I eventually added the art on, but I still have the system and I like it for flexibility where mm -hmm. the limbs are completely different skeletal meshes with a completely different rig. Okay. So like for the drum, you have the body and then there's one skeletal mesh that are the symbols that are just kind of attached to the character okay. and the way that, but it looks like one character, they're all animating at the same mm -hmm. time even though there's three different skeletal meshes and the, the limbs are running a different animation blueprint than the body. Okay. Um, I export that from Maya as three different animations and they're synced because they're all tied to the game tech. So when you export, you're basically exporting three different FBXs based on different selection sets or, or mm -hmm. however you do it in Maya. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People yeah. in chat are, are raving about uh, single frame animations now. Yeah, yeah. groovy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah they're... It, yeah, because in essence, a single frame animation with that value, it's almost a way to kind of use whatever means you want to like scrub it. Mm -hmm. when you so you saw it. my GDC talk at the Tricks of the Trade this year, I hope mm -hmm. maybe, was the yeah, about yeah. the, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Jay, I love you, man. Front but, row. So you remember, you can plug in, a lot of that was the same idea. Mm -hmm. You um, it, don't animate a turn in place. That's some, I, I can't, like, this is some AAA bullshit that got set ages ago by teams that have way too many animators. And if you're on a small team, you, you like you start making a turn in place animation, sync up, um, sync with a capsule that's doing it, yeah. Yeah, blend, sync with a capsule or My blend with the idle. My last animation stream was on a turn in place. Method. Oh, that's I didn't exactly know. what he explained <laughs> using, <laughs> how to do. Using the old really bad way. So, yeah, so, um, no, it's. I think I think it's it'll get you really good results, but it it requires a lot of work, especially for animation teams. Right. And I'll tell you, on Bioshock we did the same thing. Like we um, animated Liz turning in place and it took what like 12 can anim excuse me 12 animations because mm -hmm. you got to do um to the right and to the left yeah. to the right if you're taking three steps to the left if you're taking three steps mm -hmm. um and blend them all together and determine like you'll always get foot sliding no matter what at certain points whereas if you, instead of that you take you make one animation mm -hmm. where you're turning in place entirely and you make it 360 degrees yeah. and then all you have to do is um plug in the current rotation of the character into that animation mm -hmm. and tie it into a single frame um, animation. If you want more information on this, uh, I did a GDC, yeah. a very so short GDC talk. It's like five minutes about how to do that. Yeah, Is it on great. the vault? So can they, it's on or the they can You can go, it's also on my channel. If you go to Gwen Frey, the TA okay. on YouTube, mm -hmm. I actually just clipped out exactly how to do it. Oh, nice. So. Yeah, Gwen has a, a few of these like cool, just like simple techniques that actually get you really good results. Like it's just what happens when almost sometimes when you're lower on resources like people mm -hmm. you end up coming up with more intelligent ways to, to solve things Being scrappy. Scrappy. yeah well I, scrappy some of these things like like the quadruped solutions and the mm -hmm. things i say they you can get 95 percent of the way there with mm -hmm. very little effort um if right. you think carefully about how to do it yeah. but i mean it's it's also cool when people like you mocap dogs and stuff like that's mm -hmm. great too Please, i love dogs. i love the triple a stuff that afterwards. That's awesome. <laughs> Oh, I've never mo-capped a dog. You've never no. mo-capped a dog? No. I thought everybody just, did that. Just people. Crazy. Just people so far. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so if we were to open up right. one of these animation things right now, what would we see? Like, oh, th is um, that basically... Yeah, I don't have my... Uh, because I transferred over to this computer, I don't have my tools. But what I can show you... Let me see. I did have my installed. Let me open up... Um, I mean, what would be cool to see is like how you're breaking these animations into components. So like, sure. say this, say a, a part that's attached to the main character. Does that have an animation that's playing that sync? Or are you using like any kind of uh, rigid bodies or physics to get uh, some of the motion? Or? No physics at all. It's all just keyed animation. Um, so like this is Quat. Let's see what this is. Like this is his idol. Okay. Um, as you can see here. And all this is is it's three different rigs um, under three different namespaces in Maya. Okay. And I don't have my tools, but I have a thing that just basically, all it does is it goes into the reference files, because I'm referencing th in three files, mm -hmm. and I'm just constraining the arm to a socket, right. which is matched up to the, um, oh, this is gonna be, this might be a bit longer to explain, but um, so there's six bones that just exist in, the, in each body, mm -hmm. which are just the six sides. Okay. of a cube right mm -hmm. um and i can and i specifically have them be bones so that in maya i can uh, bring in these extremities these appendage rigs mm -hmm. constrain them to those bones or 
And also in Unreal, I can get the same result by um, bringing in the skeletal mesh right. and attaching them to the bones. Okay. And that way it's the same process for both. It keeps everything really clean. And I have nice. a tool that lets me just, that I wrote that just kind of like says um, this face, face three, attach mm -hmm. this limb. And that's how I, I do it pretty quickly and keep it simple. Oh, this one, yeah. But yeah, so there's this is um this is technically three different I'm animating it as one, one as my workflow, but it exports as three different FBXs, one for the right, one right. for each side and one for the body. Actually technically this exports as four because the stand is um technically an appendage in game. Okay. And I do that for a reason that um I'll show you why I do that. So Say, hmm, uh, what's the easiest way to show this to you? When an appendage is against the wall, see how this isn't animating anymore? Mm -hmm. Right. And here it is animating, but this isn't animating anymore, but this yeah, is. Yeah, that's cool. So um, yeah. if it's floating, it'll animate. If it's against the wall, it will not animate. Mm. And all I'm doing there is I'm saying um, if you are in... So the appendage, the way the blueprints are set up for the appendages. Let's talk about that for a minute. Because that'll explain. Oh, man, I'm getting all yeah, switched uh, around here, Jay. Because I, <laughs> I know animators always love to see, like, what is procedural? What did you, like, you know, usually if you keyframe a lot of stuff, we call it brute force. Like, you, we've, mm -hmm. we've made assets that solve all these things. Um, but, yeah, like, how, how that piece is hitting the wall and staying still. That's procedural? Like, are you using... Um, it, I don't know if I'd want to call it procedural as so much as it's just logic in the animation blueprint. So gotcha. I I have a variable that's like limb against collision, and if mm -hmm. it is, stay in bind pose. Okay. Wow. That's that's it. So the the limb is staying in bind pose. Mm -hmm. um, however, there the way the skeleton is structured for appendages is this is a lot of this is deleted. You can ignore most of this, but um, there's a root which is. The thing that's, like I said before, this is attached to the face of the body. Mm -hmm. Nothing's actually skinned to that. Um, there's the socket attach point, mm -hmm. um, which is, um, if you look in the animation blueprint, where can I find you? That is, basically that is, um, I Mm, let me see here. Attach socket. All right. So attach socket to owning pawn. What I do is, I get the owning component, which mm -hmm. in this case will be the like, say the symbol, right? Right. The skeletal mesh for the symbol. Um, I get the attach parent, which will be the body of the character. Mm -hmm. Um, I will get the. I'll find the name of a socket, which is called skin. Um, basically like it. It's the socket that you're attached to underscore right. skin. I just know that's what it's called. I find that location every tick and I, s and I set that as the socket attach point world space location. And then every tick I take the, the where I need the, the symbol to meet the body mm -hmm. and I just set that manually in world space using the skeletal controller. So that's um, I don't know where I put that. That might be higher up. I guess I could find it in like a second if I wanted to. But get there you are. So yeah, I I just get where it should be and I put it there in world space. And so that's why if I had just said be in bind pose and nothing more, mm -hmm. it would say um, where it attaches to the body wouldn't animate, and so they would fall out of sync. Okay. Whereas this yeah. keeps them kind of in sync, even though it's against the wall. And the effect is, I mean, it, it's subtle, but it's really yeah important I mean. in some places like. I mean, that's one of those things you look at it and, uh, you know, going in and I, if I were to see this and I'm like, hey, an arm sticks out and needs to like stay steady to a wall. A lot of times we'd say, well, let's just do a like IK to lock it there or, yeah. you know, and then you're doing like a, a trace to the normal. Or, you know, you're like building it that way. But this way it seems. It's just a bit very, simpler. It's simpler and you're not calculating as much. You would have to do the same thing thing anyway in a ways because mm -hmm. you'd have to no matter what you have to find out where it should flow you would have to find out a way to you would either have to find out where it has to be in world space for mm -hmm. ik and then pin it there which you could yeah. do you could do that you could yeah you could but what, this is, that's what's beautiful about this is the, it's the 
there's more than one way to do it. Yeah, yeah. And yeah totally. I, there's not a right way or a wrong way. And I usually do things the wrong way. and then, uh, <laughs> But every now and then it works out. I do too. Just we don't tell anyone. That oh, yeah. <laughs> you, make it look, you make it look easy. It's all about yeah. the end result. Yeah. And, and, of course, it's got to run on a platform. But yeah. Right. Mm. Yeah. That's kind of important. Yeah, that's a important. Just a little, a little part <laughs> of it, right? Yeah. That was a big fear, honestly, when I started. Um, I assumed at some point I'd have to move everything into code because I thought I wouldn't run it right. Mm -hmm. um, working entirely in Blueprint. And I found, don't get me wrong, like I, I have performance problems, but a lot of that is still, to th at this point, art and still things I can really easily optimize. Right. I found yeah. Blueprint, um, like it is probably less efficient, but not to the degree not to the degree that like the yeah. naysayers would or like the that you know it, it's only I, i'm having a really hard time it's only bad it's c plus plus camp <laughs> yeah well, but it's only bad if it really halts your right. product in some way if it's right. working and it's all blueprints then but i mean mm -hmm. yay yeah. how long would it have taken you for the code to get as far as you have i don't blueprints? i don't know c++ right plus, so, right. so it would have been on starter yeah, yeah it would have been yeah. You, yeah. this game wouldn't exist Ex in its form exactly yeah. so i think blueprints are perfect for this Thank you. Thank you. You're you're cool. You're my hype. You're <laughs> my new my hype joke, man, Tim. Even though my joke was bad. <laughs> Tim has the greatest joke. Yes, um, <laughs> so when you're rolling this character around the grid, is yeah. that is there a legit like root motion rolling animation, or or are you you're, you're interpolating like a position and rotation? Okay, so it's there is a there's some secondary motion here that you're seeing when uh -huh. you land. But other right. than the secondary motion, oh, uh -huh. and obviously there's procedural motion for her for the pedals. Um, oh wow, I, I forget how complicated I made some of this stuff. There's a lot. Some <laughs> but yeah, you, I mean, you have like a lot of like overlap and and settle when mm -hmm. after she does her move. So the like I said before, when I started, a lot of the overlap and settle came later on. Mm -hmm. If you look in the trailer, a lot of that doesn't exist. And it was um, let's see how I did this. So. For the basic movement, mm -hmm. uh, it's easier if I just describe this than if I show you the blueprint because there's yeah, a yeah. lot of blueprint. But um, what I'm doing is when you hit a key like WASD or, or the arrow keys, mm -hmm. um, you and in that moment, I test and see if you can move into the tile you're going to. Okay. And then I'm like, okay, what is the world space position and orientation that you'll be in? Mm -hmm. Also, what is the world space position and orientation that you are now? And I have a lerp that goes between them. And how long do I have to do this? Which is by default 0.2 seconds. Okay. And so what I do is I'm like, okay, move is st move start now. Mm -hmm. Here's your start location. Here's your end location. Here's the duration of the move. And then what's happening is on the this all lives in the player character. So on the let's see if I can find the pawn. So there is something hanging off the tick, every tick on the pawn, where I say, um, every tick, check if you should be extending a limb, check if you should be transforming a limb, check if a transform is finished and you should be sliding, and don't worry about that. And so um, basically every tick, I check and see, okay, are you moving? Okay. And what I'm doing there is I'm checking this bull. And most of the time, this is false, because most of the time you're not in the middle of doing a move. But if it's mm -hmm. true, then it runs through, and it says, okay, I am in the middle of doing a move. What is the percentage through the move that I am? Um, that's where I set that there. Um, I take that percentage, and I remap it to a curve so that you can um, let me find to specifically this curve, the rotation time remap. Which is just this is saying, start right. out moving slow, move mm -hmm. fast, then then ease into it, right? Nice. So I'm remapping that curve, and then I'm using that to drive a lerp between your starting location and your end location. And see, this is the lerp, your starting rotation, your end rotation. This is the lerp, starting position, end position. Yeah. So you're and you're I'm literally animating this character with a blueprint. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Every yeah. tick, and yeah, then. And then when you stop, that's when I, I do some stuff to settle, to like play a little settle animation, which, let me see where that lives. It moved some of this around recently. Do you play those in montages, or do you, do you play those in 
the Anna boyfriend? I have never used a montage. Never? Okay. No. Yeah. Like, I, it's weird. Like, I've never, I, I've only ever used blueprints. I never got into the vibe of using mon montages. Yeah. And I know they're, like, It's, like, just a way powerful. to play, it's just a way to play an animation yeah. while you're in the blueprint and not have to do it with blueprint logic. Yeah. But I've seen your, I've seen your streams. It's definitely yeah. simpler in a way. Yeah, like it's we, we a typically mindset. use it for um, like ability stuff or like kind of one-off things. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah, but yeah. I should probably get into using those. I never use <laughs> Yeah, because. Yeah. I mean, there, there's uses for them, but it, you, it, like I said, you could do it either way. It's just, it's a matter of. I've got like the one, I do the, just the yeah. blueprints with like the animation blueprint. I always, yeah. if I have to one-off something, I just do it. It is nice as an animator to have everything that's going to be animating in one blueprint that you could test everything. Mm -hmm. That's the problem with montages is it's hard to test their effect on your anim blueprint. Mm -hmm. so I can see that. Yeah, yeah. Pretty sure you can encapsulate it too. Um, upset aerial animation after movement. Oh, this is this does all kinds of things actually. This detects if you're standing on somebody. Blah blah blah. Here's where the actual mm -hmm. animation happens. Um, pulse body for follow through. So on the animation blueprint, I call this, it just says each character has a different amount based on what limb they're going on to, which okay. is like the the float number. How much are you pulsing? What's your mm -hmm. follow through vector? Which is like, I moved, forget the rotation. I moved from this tile to this tile. Uh -huh. So my follow through is going to be in that direction. Right. Um, and then I set should execute follow through pulse. And I don't remember what this does because it was an eternity ago. And so, you know, you have three distinct characters so are you putting their personalities into these these curves like you're setting curves based on like hey this character is a little more slow and ease in ease out yeah that that's why they're variables that? also you pulse different amounts like if you're landing on um if you're the drummer and you're landing on your stand you're obviously going to pulse more than if you're landing on something rigid mm -hmm. right and so that all gets set there um and yeah and so like there's a there's a all that drives something. I don't even remember what. <laughs> Somewhere. State. Spawn locomotion. Yeah, I, I would love to, like, kind of look go. at your state. Yeah. Here's the follow through pulse. So there it is. Like, here's the vector. Okay. Here's the pulse amount. Um, I'm using. I like that you have cached poses, by the way. I really love that update. Yes. I know it's, it's eternity so ago useful. for you. Yeah. We yeah. didn't have that on, on um, the Flame of the Flood. That was just a lot of. It was just a mess back then. Um, and yeah, so this, okay, so I take the follow through vector and the pulse amount and I drive a bone, which is just the body. Okay. Um, I use that to, to move a bone. Um, and what am I doing? What's this? Oh, yeah, yeah, You're don't worry about it. Ooh, yeah. yeah, yeah. This is, I, I decided when, like, um, when you land, you should kind of get a little, I was gonna say, that you like should a little scale squash out. and stretch. Yeah, and a little stuff. squash yeah. and stretch. So yeah, so this is just, it's procedurally um, yeah. pulse, moving you down a bit and scaling you out a bit. And uh, th as you can tell, that's just kind of like a pose. So I'm mostly managing that by, mm -hmm. you blend into this and then immediately blend out of it. And the, how you blend into it is kind of like a curve. Um, mm. that, so it, I'm basically, I'm blending to a pose over a mm. curve and then blending out of that pose according to a curve that are set in the transition. Nice. So yeah, if you're in like a Maya DCC app or something, that's where you know you have your poses and your curves. This is essentially allowing you to change those those curves in a real time environment while hitting the same pose, which yeah. is like it's great. Well, hitting a different pose, right? Because the pose is um, set based on variables. Oh right, right. Yeah. yeah. So like the pose could be different and the curves could be different depending on the character and so forth. Yeah. So yeah, man, it's uh, it's all. That's brilliant. Yeah, I was always a fan of uh, David Rosen's uh, what was it, overgrowth. Oh stuff yeah, stuff yeah. you do like single poses and curves and yeah, yeah that was so. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. It's it's very unique in the way that <laughs> it. But you said I think there's no one perfect way to do any of it, is there? It's what there's works best for. That's what embodies your game and helps yeah. give it. Yeah. Its uniqueness, its uniqueness right? Yeah. Like. If you did it the same way that everybody else builds their games, then all the animations would feel the same. Right. But the point is that it gives it its different feel. It's personality. And style. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and that's awesome. I think it's 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 super cool, and to see that it's being done by one person and it's all <laughs> yeah. your imagination coming, you know, manifest is really. Yeah, 
I mean, I'm a huge believer in parameter-based animation. You know this. We've talked mm -hmm. about this a lot. Like, it's why we're friends and stuff. It's <laughs> like, a, like, I... The all of, of your friendship. All yes. of my talks have been about how to not have keys in Maya and move them into move them from a DCC app, but instead in how to have everything be variables. I think it's important. I, I think a lot of the the stuff that's really powerful in video games lately has been, and a lot of the stuff I love about the Unreal Engine mm -hmm. is the ability to um, drive everything based on variables. Don't have a, f I, I hate the World of Warcraft falling loop into landing animation blend into idle, mm -hmm. right? Like the blend from loop into land into idle. I think it, it just, it'll never look good. Whereas if you just bl have an animation that is a landing that you animate, mm -hmm. and then you um, select the frame of that animation based on how far you are from the ground, you can have a you can have a land that looks perfect every time. And that wasn't my right. idea. That was Loren's idea. Right. Uh, yeah. I was. Uh, that's very familiar to the. That was a process in Paragon was mm -hmm. use parameters to then pick the right frame of animation. Yeah. And it gives you a more in sync performance to what the game is doing. I love I stole yeah. that from Paragon. I yeah. thought that was brilliant. I, I like I think there just needs to be more of that in every way. Like yeah. I just think we need to like I don't think we should stop with falling animations. I thought you right. what you did there was great. And and there's a actually a good reason behind that as well. Like when you're making a game, games are not made perfect. Like when you first make the yeah. first iteration of your game, a lot of things actually suck about it. But while you're making your game, you're making assets like animations for it. But things are inevitably, inevitably going to change, like character speeds, transitions. But you've already made all these animation assets yes. for it, right? So if you don't have a parameter-based thing, now you have to update all these keyed assets to, to update it. So the parameter stuff allows you to do not do, uh, dials and knobs the, the whole time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's, it's, it's important to pursue things like this, especially for larger teams, because I think mm -hmm. the... The best games are the ones where everybody is able to work and iterate as much as possible for as long as possible. And as soon right. as you have this thing where it's like, oh, we can't, we can't fuss with the level design anymore because mm -hmm. um, we've built out the environment art and it's locked down. That's when you've made mm -hmm. a huge mistake. And I feel like in animation, it's the same way. I feel like if three days before content lock, the designer wants to change the speed of a reload, they should be able to do it. Yep, and yep. it should, the system, maybe it won't look like exactly perfect. Mm -hmm. And it, maybe there'll be some rework, but I think that's so important still to just be able to do that. Because the second, if everybody can iterate, as soon as you reach a world where everybody can iterate the entire time, mm -hmm. and you can get in as many iteration loops as possible, that's when you make the best possible game. Right. Yeah, because you, you don't want a good game to be held back from the art team didn't have the schedule to create new assets for the new speeds, right? And then, therefore, your game has to suffer. You want it, it's always gameplay first, no matter what department you're in. You're always supporting the fun gameplay aspect. And so, yeah, things like this are perfect for yeah. uh, fine tuning that. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big believer. All right. Any so, any <laughs> we got any questions? Open it up? Oh, yeah, we do. Um, yeah. They've been wondering yeah. if you could speak a little more to the audio syncing. So, you mentioned sort of an audio tick. Um, but would, would something like this give low-level syncing for something like a music or rhythm game in Vsync? OK. So I have not, I've done a lot of learning about audio. Right. I mean, you have to keep in mind, I'm an animator by trade. And so a lot, and this project was fun because I got to learn all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm still learning a lot about audio. And I'm still digging into the new audio engine, which I think is really sweet. Right. Um, I think in historically, I would have never made a rhythm game in Unreal. Um, but the new audio engine is definitely getting there. Uh, like I, just the ability to tether gameplay to the audio tick now, mm -hmm. because in the past the audio tick was always some nebulous thing you could never get to. It's huge, right. um, and so yes, you can because you can hang it off of that. Depending on what kind of rhythm game you're making, you could easily make one now. Yeah. And there's new stuff going well, on. Well, we just had we were just talking. Stuff. If you're watching the news, like um, we have Soundfall coming out, and they they let you pick. You can basically pick a song, virtually any song, mm -hmm. dump it in, and it reads. The music and you can tie it ties the animation to those so while you're you're timing your animations based on audio tech audio you could tech. very Said. easily tie it to anything in the in the new audio engine synthesizer it's something i if i had more time like i'm one person so i can't right. look into everything kind part two wait you're yeah. not like just an expert on all things <laughs> yeah, yeah when when kind <laughs> one makes like millions yeah, yeah. and stuff oh yeah then i'll come back and for kind two i'll, I'll spend like, these are all the things yeah, yeah. 
That's one of my pet projects. I would have loved to look more into the new audio yeah. engine and tie that more into animation because I think there is definitely a lot there. Definitely. That kind of leads into, they were actually wondering, what did you wish you knew before you got started? Hmm. Interesting. Uh, well, I didn't know I was making a puzzle game at first. If I, Surprise. <laughs> if I did. Well, it would have been nice to know that. It would have been nice to have played more puzzle games and stuff. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of the going back and rework has actually been on the design side, surprisingly. Um, I guess that shouldn't be a surprise. I've never designed a game. But, like, it, yeah, there was a lot of rework there. I wish I knew more about that going in. So do you feel like ultimately, because you were making proto prototypes and then, like, sort of morphed over time, do you feel like you wish you had spent more time in the, like, early development and, like, research phase mm -hmm. to help inform no, I honestly don't believe that. I think you, because you can easily go, just go down the wrong path if you do that, right? Mm -hmm. I think it happened the way it had to happen. Like, I, I think it's better to learn by doing and then rework it if you have to. I, I think spending too much time in pre-pro is a, a huge mistake. You should always, <laughs> you should feel like you're not in pre-pro even though you are. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you should be, you should feel like you're making the game and then discover, oh, that actually wasn't what I was making. I'm making this instead. More organic and letting it, like, have a life of its own until, like, you achieve Absolutely. what has the best feel. Yeah. I've uh, heard the analogy before of being a chef. Like, rather than <laughs> plan out all your ingredients perfectly, it's mm -hmm. kind of like mix in and taste, adjust and taste. And, but, yeah. Yeah. It, it sounds like that's the better approach to get something. Just keep, Yeah. yeah. I, I think a lot of people get stuck in decision paralysis, especially early on, where they're like, I want to do this the perfect way. Let me do all this research. And all that time you're spending, uh, there's a saying that the an okay plan executed immediately is better than the perfect plan executed tomorrow. Hmm. That It's just better to just start like doing it. it. And yeah. um, it, if you just keep doing it and you just keep working, at a minimum you'll learn stuff. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I, uh, I don't know, that's just how I've always yeah. worked. Do you, that's great advice. Do you worry that you'll continue to iterate and continue to iterate and continue to iterate to the point where you just, you, you don't release? You just keep wanting to mm -hmm. improve? No, because, I mean, I can, I have different things holding me accountable, for instance. Um, do I? I guess, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not afraid of that. Maybe I should be more afraid of that. <laughs> Oops. But uh, no, it's okay. Like I've, I've already, I've reached a point where I'm like, I've finished the puzzles for the game, for right. instance. So right now I'm in the the art polish and writing phase. And like, I, I'm not going to go back and revisit the puzzles unless I have a very good reason to. Right. So I've already reached a point where I'm like, I know exactly how big the game is. I've written it. Right. Um, and now it's finishing it. So at this point, I'm not worried about that at all. Um, there might've been a time where that should have been a fear or could have, should have been a fear, but wasn't. For, if you keep in mind, I was doing this while I had a, a part-time job. Like, a, initially a full-time job, and then a part-time job. And I just left to found Chump Squad and do this, like, full-time. I just went full-time on this a month and a half ago. Yeah. So, um, because it there's a lot of freedom when something is your, your part-time thing, where you're like, oh, I have money coming in, and, you know, like, I, I can spend some time, and I can play with this. And even then, I, I didn't... Um, I knew there'd be an end date. I knew that there was a right. maximum size of the game and stuff. That's good. Yeah, I, I, that's what I always worry about when I think about making a game. Is you know where do I have a content block or where do I say that mm -hmm. this is uh, I, I've made enough because we're our own even worse critics for our own best. Yeah. So I'll criticize every little piece until it's just uh, paralysis by analysis kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's it's awesome that you have moved past that and and oh. uh, are are getting to the point where you're putting the polish on it. Yeah. I think some of that comes down to, a lot of that comes down to experience. And another part of that is always having deadlines yeah. that are external and that you cannot move. And okay. I think that's true. We had that, um, so when we made the plane in the flood. We made it in two years um, on time and on budget. And a lot of that was, uh, all right, we have to have this much done before we take the game to PAX. We have to have this much done before we take the game to, like we need to have a trailer for E3 for right. Microsoft to show. And we have these firm deadlines and it's not like PAX isn't going to wait Right. Like if we're late. Wait, wait, we're not ready. Let's push so, back a week. Yeah. Exactly. So you either cut scope or you finish. Um, right. You know, and once you get into that mindset, um, at any given moment, I have a deadline that I'm working towards for some yep. reason. And I have a list of things that will get done for that deadline. At least now. Yeah. Back at when I was just playing around like with prototypes, I didn't, but that was, you know, I didn't know what I was making back then. Fair enough. Let's see. Let's see. 
They're wondering if you wanted to create. No, here, here's your animating. Put your animator hat on. Right. Okay. If you wanted to create a more stop motion feel, they wanted to know if you would still use Slurp, or is there a way to do like stepped curves and blueprints? Mm. How would you get? How would you try to achieve that? I have opinions about this. I'm gonna let you go first. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Her Ooh. opinions are going to be way better than mine. Um, <laughs> no, they're not. Um, I might use, well, if you do 2D, what's the, the flip book? You know, you could do, you could use that. Um, mm -hmm. We do allow step frames and we do allow step frame interpolation and animations. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you like interpolate at a sub 30 frame rate to get it or randomize like kind of randomize the animation progression more than a single frame to get kind of inconsistency. Because your, your compression is going to murder it if you try to do it just through keys. Yeah. So you've got to do yeah. something. It would have to be, and you can't, I mean, you're... Like, the, yeah, a lot of things contribute to the stop motion look. One is, like, lack of motion blur, and then, like, this imperfection of, like, in-betweens. Yeah. And so I think... It would have... It, it depends on what your goals are and why you're trying to achieve that stop motion look. I think yeah. to, if you were serious about achieving it, you would basically have to do sprites or some sort of, not necessarily yeah. sprites, but... Um, I've seen some good stuff with material shaders where it's like a, a clay shader mm -hmm. where, you know, like when you watch old clay stop motion, you see like the thumbprints kind of do that. I've yeah. seen that effect. Um, mm -hmm. So I think... So that's yeah. the visual side. So that's the visual side of it. Asset. Yeah. On the animation side. On the animation side, you just can't learn. Right? You really had thoughts. Yeah. I want to hear your oh, thoughts. No, no I would have. Um, first off, I've seen people try and fail so many times, I don't think I would try. <laughs> I, would ask, I would ask why you want to do this and what, what this is achieving for your art style. But, um, Or if you're just trying to do something unique. Um, and yeah, I, I, would, uh, I would go to 3D sprites, depending on your camera. So this is this is a big thing. So is this stop motion assuming you're in like a 2D camera or is it 3D where you can pan around the character? Like does it have to be skeletal bone based? It is sort yeah. of generic. But to me when I think of stop motion I think of the more like 3D. Like it Yeah. I like my first instinct would be don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> All I know is uh, I've tried to get a stop motion look with animation before and it looks like and I utterly failed at it. It just looks like bad animation or bad compression. It does. It just it's just very hard to make it look intentional. You could, yeah. I mean, my. I guess if I had to do it, I would start off by, um, I would take an animation that I already had as a per, like to test with. Mm. Um, I would eliminate motion. First things first, get rid of motion blur and everything from the pawn. Simplify the pawn down. And then I would literally do the thing I did earlier where I go select a frame. Mm -hmm. And I would select a frame uh, I would have a timer that's just updating the selected frame, mm -hmm. um, rather than just to get around any way that Unreal is pl any any interpolation that Unreal could possibly try to put there, or any animation compression whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And so I would select a frame based on the game tick yeah. at like I don't know twenty frames a second or something. Oh yeah, that's the other thing is like a lot of stop motion is done like the old school stuff was done at like twelve frames a second. Mm -hmm. like, so I would so, yeah. I would export stepped keys from Maya, and mm -hmm. I would also just make sure there's no inter-frame, yeah. um, what do you call it, blending, mm -hmm. just to make absolutely sure. I would I would manipulate the tick, and I would call a frame rather than play through. That's how I would start. Yeah, honestly, that's a question that we'd spend like Forever. days on. <laughs> <laughs> like, but that's a start. That's where error. you would start in yeah, investigating. That's where you definitely start with the, the like, how are you going to get a non-interpolated frame and mm -hmm. then get rid of motion blur? You know? Yeah, and then a lot of stop motion is the weirdness of, like, the cloth and stuff, too, mm -hmm. right? It's the getting those weird wrinkles in the cloth, which I think, obviously, you're not going to use cloth. You're going to sculpt whatever cloth system you, like, mm -hmm. whatever clothing the character is wearing. You're going to either change the blend shape every every time you update the tick or every time you update the frame. Yeah. So you got us going. We're going to we're going to figure this out. So <laughs> I would Should do we get a whiteboard. Yeah, let's get a whiteboard. <laughs> um we're going to need another hour. Let's see. Yeah. Um So that's a good jumping off point, I think. Uh, yeah, good yeah. good luck. <laughs>
investigate it, give it some trial there, and and run with it. Like honestly, yeah, uh, watch stop motion. Like when you just watch the stop motion you're thinking of, and just break it down. Like make a list of like what makes that look like stop motion. Mm-hmm. Let's see, what else you yeah. got for us, and folks? Um, the whole chat's trying to figure it out too. It's kind of amazing. Um, <laughs> let's see, they were wondering. Had, did you consider using any timeline components for the animation? Or are you just, you wanted to keep it all? Timeline components in what way? Like I use timelines everywhere. So I'm okay. just not quite sure which uh, which thing you're, we're talking about. Um, so you do, you do use at least like typical timelines. Yeah, yeah. For, yeah, for certain things I have to, for like blending effects and things. And so forth. Are you using sequencer for your cinematic moment? Yeah, yeah, yeah you want to see them? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, wait, where am I? Last game. So, so that's one thing with like Paragon and Fortnite is the animators don't have a lot of opportunity to work in sequencer. So I always like seeing what uh, people have done. Let me see. So here's all the scenes in the game. There's not that many yet because a lot of them are stubbed. Um, uh, if I pull it over here, you can't see it. But so, like, I'll let this play out. And so these are keyframe sequence events, right? You're yeah, not... these are. I can pull up this file if you want to see it. Uh, hmm. But it's just a series of skeletal meshes that are moving. Um, this, So we can break down this whole scene. I made most of this while streaming. This is all just rigs for the most part. This is, um, these are rigged things. If you want to see like that gizmo. Here, let's look at that gizmo. That's, uh, where, where do you live, gizmo? But during s the sequence, uh, sequencer events, um, are you running any anim blueprints on anything? No, it's man. All, it's pure like pre. I don't cross the streams. I'm in sequence or I'm in blueprint. Nice. Uh, I know there's late ways to cross the streams now. I just haven't dug into it that much. Um, is that the right thing? I think that's the right thing. How do I get to the find? You know what? I can just navigate to it. But like for here, you know, your your characters are made up of multiple skeletal meshes. Are you dropping the each individual s skeletal meshes into sequencer and playing them at the same time, or do yep. you have a cinematic rig? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, this animation's rough, but there's yeah, there's not one rig. They're all just different files. Like here's the okay. here's the gizmo. Here's the animation for it. The way this is done is it's blending a blend shape, um, that sort of turns it into where are you? going gizmo mm -hmm. yeah. so this is just a blend shape mm -hmm. that's blending on and off that's your blend shape curve down there on yep. the timeline. That's yeah that's the blend shape curve um and i i think you can see on my youtube channel how my exporter works where i just have um in maya i take and i put the name of the blend shape on the root bone mm -hmm. and i um all the keys basically go on on that Mm -hmm. And that gets automatically imported into Unreal, and then I just set that to drive the blend shape. I think, oh, no, no, no. No, I don't even have to do that anymore. That's right. Unreal just does this now, right? If you yeah, key a blend you, shape, it just happens. key a blend shape, it'll, it'll automatically bring in the curve. Yeah, that's and we right. Do, we do have the pose asset now, if you want to mm -hmm. get fancy, and you can try mm -hmm. individual poses. All right, after the stream, you can show me that, because yeah, I don't know much that. about it. <laughs> I haven't been keeping up, man. I've been busy. <laughs> I've been learning about audio and stuff. Like yeah, you got things to do. I feel bad because I used to be like, I know everything about animation. And now I'm like, I know too many things and I have no time uh, for yeah. animation. You're still <laughs> teaching us things. You know, you know enough. Uh, well, cool. Yeah. Let's yeah, see. That's awesome. uh, they're wondering if it's possible in the current version of UE4 to do fully IK-driven animations like humanized actors and do interaction between several different actors. Every all things are possible like that. <laughs> it's a matter all of things. like time and <laughs> like and the it, it always comes down to the why like mm -hmm. solving IK in a smart way to have things meet with other things. That's not the only way to solve it. So sometimes there's other ways, but right. you can. Yeah, um, if it's a networked game, probably not because you have. You know, two characters moving over network. That's always updating, and right. you're never going to get a precise trace to a character or like to, to the other character and so 
some things you just you don't want to try when right. you approximate yeah. it. I'm a huge so. believer in reversing IK James. Like you know this. Like yeah, I yeah. I don't think you should um because the most important thing for a character is usually not like if if I'm t I'm touching Jay's shoulder, the most important thing is that this my hand touching his shoulder looks right and if there's some swimming in my shoulder that doesn't matter because the skinning could cover that up yeah. and so why not just have your joint chain be wrist shoulder elbow or i'm sorry yeah, have wrist the, elbow shoulder the correction have, stuff happens here exactly yeah. have the have the ik solver and the target be in the shoulder mm -hmm. and then just set this the position of this bone to be here with a skeletal control and that way you make sure that your characters sync up yeah that, uh, to me like that's almost always been a better solution. You, the downside there is then you can't ragdoll. Right. right. Um, because if you ragdoll, your shoulder's just like flying out. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, unless you just have super awesome ragdoll that can change hierarchies mm -hmm. or like a runtime rig. Yeah, yeah, yeah if there's sure. a way to like change the rig yeah, for the ragdoll, yeah. that'd be one thing. But just ideas for the future here, Jay. <laughs> yeah. If you want to no, rework your ragdoll tech. We, we do have a runtime rig in the works that will allow different constraints to, to turn on and off at different times. So hmm. sure. it's coming. Right. That'll be really cool. Yeah, yeah. that will be but cool. It, but it seems like in a lot of these questions, and this is probably applicable to game dev at large, is like make sure whatever you're trying to achieve is actually worth it. So it's like yeah. maybe that thing sounds really cool or it seems really interesting, but like what mm -hmm. impact that is that does it have and is there a way to cheat it? So a lot of times I feel like in game development, you, mm -hmm. know, you may think this is the way it works in real life, but this is the way we do it in game. And it's all about your selling an effect or selling yep. a movement, whether that's how it's actually done. Sometimes even, you know, like mocap is amazing and you can get these wonderfully, you know, animated mm -hmm. faces. But a lot of times in, in like cartoons or films, I feel like they often then mm -hmm. have to go in, clean it up and over animate because it didn't feel, it right. didn't feel right. Even though it was like 100% true to yeah. how you actually moved your face. That's not peop what people wanted to see. Yeah. yeah. And so it's always about making sure it feels right regardless of like what's actually happening. Yeah. And when, when you list out these problems and stuff, like people around me are tired of hearing me say this, but we <laughs> tend to skip over the why. Like, why do you want that? Like, why? Because we, we quickly want to get to the what. And so people are like, hey, I want cool IK stuff. But then like mm -hmm. back up a step and really focus on the why, like really ask it, like get down to it. And then that'll change everything past that. Like once you answer the why, everything past that is easier to answer. Maybe. I don't know. I I've, mean, I've been on both sides of this. If you're, if yeah. you're basically making a game, then I think that's absolutely true. Yeah. But there's also like, sometimes you just want to have fun with an experiment at home. And some of those experiments become like the, become the, the things that I give GDC talks about, right? Oh yeah, true. And yeah. so like, yeah. I, I guess I would say like, if you're, if you really just want to see if you can make stop motion look cool, and maybe you do and maybe you don't, maybe you find a different art style that's cool along the way. Like I think there's something to be said. Making th this is a medium that should be fun to work in. And right, if right. you think right. it's if you want to make a completely procedural character where everything works in IK, maybe you'll accidentally make a puzzle game out of it. Like you don't know, <laughs> like, you don't know what happens. Right. And so if you if you just keep following your muse, I don't think there's anything wrong with that either. Yeah. Just yeah, so long as it's not, not your vocation. Uh, Right. As long as you know what you're doing there. There's nothing wrong with trying it. But it's also like making, yeah, what's absolutely. what are you trying to achieve and does it? Yeah, I feel like it? when it comes to experimenting, like almost all rules are off. Like there's almost no. Yeah. 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 yeah it's like that's that's when you're supposed to just kind of break things. That's the best way to learn is break and tear apart <laughs> and try over and over. Yeah. So they're wondering, um, so one, of, one of them are talking about being a beginner and like just getting into animation. Do you have any tips on the planning stage of a character to ensure better animation from the start? Hmm. You, yeah. you want me to do it? Uh, yeah, you're the guest of honor. Uh, <laughs> you, 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 yeah, let's start with you. I mean, I usually, um, if you're an animator, specifically for like you're trying to animate a game character, I'm assuming in this question, the first thing I always do is I strike a pose. What is the idle pose? Um, what is the, and, and think about what that character does. Like, is there combat? What is their combat pose? What is their idle pose? And I get that into game and I look at that in camera before I do anything else. I think it's really important to get just the um, the character in a pose. And usually then I, I work on, um, before I do any animation, I make sure that the character posed moving around in the game camera feels fine. So even if they're, 
like I a lot of times this is called T-pose ballet, but like when you take the thumbstick and you push it, the character moves. And you can manipulate just from that how fast should the character move? Um, what is the what is the acceleration to get the character to move there? And does that feel right? And does it feel snappy? So much of your animation when you're a game animator is not the keys you put down. It's making that, um, say you're playing a third person game, how a lot of character comes down to how quickly do they get moving when they start moving and how quickly do they stop just from the game side of things, just getting the pit, like even for the cube, getting a cube to physically move through the world using your gameplay in the right, um, at the right speed, getting that to feel good initially, yes, they're going to redo it, but having a good starting foundation there is actually very important. And then from there, um, usually I don't actually animate the idols until almost the end. I just get a key pose or two. Then I usually move into the, the movement. Like, um, say, say I have a character and I, he's kind of heavy and I want him to kind of jump to moving and then he moves pretty fast and then he kind of, he kind of like overshoots a bit and stops. Um, and I'll see how much of that I can get done just in the engine. And then I'll, I'll see what the speed is that he moves to and I'll, I'll do like a, the lumbering mo motion there. And then the next thing I'm doing is I'm blending from an, an idle pose to this motion and out of it. And I'll see how, how closely I can get that to look, to look good just nothing but like the movement without any like idle to move animation or any moved idle animation and the pose and usually if you can get that to look good and you can get your character in that you've done the vast majority of the work and then after that it's like you know you get 90 percent of the way there and 10 percent of the time or whatever <laughs> then yeah. it's then it's the tedium of like okay now i actually figure out the idle I figure out the fidgets. Now I figure out, um, is this enough here? How do I get the foot facing to work when I blend from mm -hmm. this idle into the motion and when I blend out of that? And then I worry about the turn in place. But um, And you'll add character to all of these things. It could be for a, a heavy character that's dragging a, a blunt object on the ground. Like your turn in place is an involved thing that happens slowly. Mm -hmm. It could be that something that has to happen fast for gameplay reasons. Knowing that ahead of time is incredibly vital. Um, so I, I would urge you not to put down any keys until you actually have like a cube or T-posed character moving around um, in game because that is animation, is the movement that happens when a, um, the, the technically code that happens when you, your character is moving, right? Yeah, and that's a trap. I, I still fall into this a lot is skipping that step of this, just the capsule physics motion because if you don't get that right, you're battling that the rest of the time. Your mm -hmm. jump animation, people will say, hey, your jump feels sluggish. But it's like, you might not need to tweak the animation at all. It's your capsule. Yeah. Right? And then you ch you change that later, and now you're like over, you've accidentally overcorrected, and you're not quite mm -hmm. sure. And if you find yourself in that place, I, I always, there's been times when I'm like, okay, replace the character with a cube. Why does, get yeah. the jump to feel good then. Don't, if you realize that your jump, that something's wrong with the capsule, Mm -hmm. Don't look at it with animation at all. T take the animation off again. Get yeah. it right with the capsule. Then put your character in there. Then fix it. Because um, it's it, and level you gravity too. Like the gravity mm -hmm. setting on your level can make a huge difference. Just one point two might feel better when things fall um, in Unreal. Yeah. So there's yeah there's yeah you you describe exactly that's the right way. It's like start idle is kind of like your cornerstone of everything else mm -hmm. and. I guess beyond that, just to help add anything else, is like what systems does your game have beyond locomotion? And those, because you want to figure if those need any more R&D than just a locomotion set. So if mm -hmm. it's like climbing or melee or shooting, it's figuring out how those systems work as well. So it's, sometimes it's good just to write down like what are your big verbs for the game? And then this is where I'll, I'll differentiate, where I'm like, also, if at all possible, don't use turn in place or <laughs> any any transition animations, if at all possible. Because the second you do that, you lose the ability to iterate. And the most important thing is the ability to iterate. The second you have, you've made an animation that is your idle to run, you can't update your idle or your run anymore unless you update that transition. And you're going to end up making a lot of those transitions. So if you update your idle, now you have to update your idle to jump, your idle to run, your idle to everything. So two thing y you can live in a world where you finish your idol you make sure you polish it you make it perfect before you do anything else but i'd argue that's a stupid world to live in if at all possible try to have as few transition animations as possible for as long as possible so that you can 
if you decide later to change the idle or to change the run or something, you can. Yeah, yeah. It's my my words of advice. <laughs> no, that's good. I feel like that's very helpful and very. It's a good jumping off point. I mean, like things to consider. So. Mm. Okay. Yeah, um, like yeah, yeah. It just just avoid the desire as an animator to get as much stuff in as possible and see it all. It's like start start slow. It really helps. Okay. Good advice. Um, they're wondering, what do you think of motion matching? For instance, um, for Honor used it, do you think it'll be a thing in the future? Or be widely used? Um, do you want to talk about it from an indie point of view? Like, oh, I, um, I have a, actually, this is a good question. To you, do you see that as a procedural-like solution? Or do you see it as something that's just going to cause a lot of work? Okay, so I see it in the same way I see um, as an indie now because I have been indie for long enough that I'm mm -hmm. no longer like I just have a different perspective on things. Sure. I look at it as the same way that indies look at mocap, mm -hmm. which is to say I don't know if everybody mm -hmm. in the chat wants to be indie necessarily, so this may not apply to you. But um, there's um, there's way mocap is important in the indie space because it allows teams that don't have a lot of animators or any animators to rapidly get a character running around. They can buy a character off the asset store and get things going using mocap assets and things like this, and they can stitch together themes. And so in that way, it's important. And I think motion matching in the indie space will fill that same role. It's for teams that don't have a lot of animators or that don't have animators so that they can achieve, mo they can get motion really quickly. I think it's going to be for the indie space, the sheer number of animations required means you're probably not gonna be a person that, um, it, there's just so much work up front that you're probably in the indie community not going to be making motion matching. It's in the same way that if you're an indie, you probably don't have the budget to build a mocap studio. Um, it's just out of reach in a certain way, and I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Um, but I, I do think, yeah, I, I think motion matching is something that'll be valuable because you'll be able to buy it off of the Unreal Marketplace. So in the indie space, it'll be important that way. Yeah, and I feel motion matching right now in its current form is like step one. So right now it's kind of, you know, people see it as you need a large database of animations from like mocap for it to work. But if you combine motion matching with maybe machine learning that can auto create missing anims you have from a set um, or do more with less data, then I think eventually motion matching will be kind of standard when you, rather than come up with like a big, state machine, that will kind of be your automatic way to just know what animation to pivot yeah. to. Um, but it, it, it's very theoretical, but I, I personally yeah. think it's going to go that way. Whenever someone says machine learning, I think about it the same way I think about like blockchain technology. It's like, yeah, yeah. someday this will work because blockchain. It's yeah. like someday this will work because because machine learning will figure it out. And I don't know. I've been so looking at the machine learning stuff. When, when I say... <laughs> When I say machine learning, I just mean like the, the trial and error, like the computer's just trying something and then you, you give it like this dictated result mm -hmm. and then you're, it, but it's, it's got to be a very small problem to solve. You can't just say like machine learning is going to give me a whole locomotion set, yeah. but you can say like here here's a, a, a medium sized character who's running and turning in place. You have that mocap, mo right? But then you have a heavy character. How would a heavy character turn? You don't have that data set. And as you build up, you know, these companies that do have a lot of motion, they mm -hmm. could probably build up a more precise database of, how, of the, what the machine has learned, and it's always going to get better over time. I find, um, uh, I suspect it'll be not machine learning for a really long time. It'll be yeah. animators. The machine is not that good at it. Maybe right. it'll, maybe, I don't know. I, the animator It'll be a long machine. time. That, yeah, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's not like next year that's going to happen. No. The, Right now, for, for me personally, if you were to say, hey, we're using motion matching on your your project, and I would I'd be fearful because it's kind of, right now in some cases it's black box because the computer is deciding what pose to hit whenever you're hitting something in game. And as an animator, I would need a ton of debug tools to say, why did you choose that frame? What was I doing? And, and so motion matching also needs to come with a ton of debug tools. Um, so. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. So as a developer, at what point, um, so like when you first started, were you confident that you could just build a game by yourself? Because they're asking, it's like, 
they were wondering, when did you gain the confidence to say, okay, I know I can finish this as a solo developer? Mm. Well, I mean, I've never tried to make a game solo until um, uh, until I started working on Khan, right? Mm -hmm. and so, and, and at that point, I'd already been in the industry for, like, almost 10 years. Right. So, um, I guess it would have been almost 10 years. But, like, I, I hadn't really tried before that. I think it's pretty... If you look around, you can... I think it's important if you're starting today and you want to make a game mm -hmm. to just go to a game jam and make a game. Yeah. Do the Unreal game jams. I hear they're really cool. Yay. Um, or um, there's like uh, the person who's talking about puzzle games earlier. There's something called Puzzle Script. Uh, you can sit down, make a Puzzle Script game. Like a lot of people, now I think about it, I used to make games. We just called them mods, right? <laughs> like uh, We just called them different things back in the day. So you can... Make small experiences and then make slightly bigger experiences each time. That's definitely a way to do it. Um, so, uh, but the question was, where did I gain, gain the confidence? I I knew when I started this, I could make it immediately. But that was because at the time when I started it, I thought it would be like a 20-minute game. Yeah. It was a small uh, game. Yeah. And I just had a lot of fun and I didn't want it to... I was like, I could finish this, but why? And then I... Because it was a hobby. And so I, I just kept going with it. Uh if I had known that was, if I had set out to, like, if I sat down and I was like, I'm going to make a five hour game, I would have been like, I can't possibly, it was specifically a five hour puzzle game. So you've never made one? I'd been like, no. Like, but I didn't know I was making that initially. So. Right. So I didn't need confidence. I had, I had ignorance instead. <laughs> it was far more powerful. Ignorance is bliss, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's good but to be naive. Maybe that's the point where you were afraid of not being able to finish right like you know you're gonna you're gonna never uh, get to the end no it wasn't a, i mean my intention was like to make a couple prototypes and then at one point like my intention was to make a prototype just for movement that i could possibly move in a game someday right like i'm always prototyping stuff at home and it's usually stuff ideas for things that will eventually be pulled into a different game i never like i've always prototyped things at home yeah like this is a cool material idea the thing that you guys were talking about, like, why do you make something for no reason? I do that all the time at home. Like, that's right. basically all I do for fun, right? Um, so uh, that's a sad thing to admit. So uh, <laughs> No, it's not. It's an amazing thing to admit. I, but, but yeah, like, so I've always, like, played around with right. making stuff at home that I would at one point put into a game. I didn't intend to make a game until, like, I don't know, like a year ago. So and you were just prototype. You were just, hey, let's have some fun, and I want to make something quirky and, and yeah, see how something I, works. I think I... Yeah, it was before I started streaming, like two months before I started streaming, I was like, you know what, I'm going to pull this and this and this together, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a puzzle game out of it, and it's going to be, I think I remember telling my coworkers, I'm like, all right, I've decided to make a game, like a full game, I'm going to put it on itch, it's going to be like, I don't know, like a short little game, because we were going down to, to work in part time, and I knew I had like a couple months, and I was like, yeah, so I'll spend half my time doing this, and half my time making a cute little game for itch, because itch is cool. Yeah. Yeah, and then 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 then, then you got the itch. No, yeah. Then, mm -hmm. the Can't. I'm sorry. It's just too got easy. out of control. Yeah, yeah it's just too easy. So that's awesome though. I mean, it's it's one of the things like I'll start working on a project and like in my head I'll I'll draw this five year roadmap and how it's gonna and I never finish. I never I never finish past like I made the project file. Yeah. Because I get to that point where it's like, where do I start? And it's almost too much. And I, I like the concept of just find one piece. Start there, and here is here is your platform, mm -hmm. and then put something else on that platform, and put something else. And, yeah, and, and so. so like I wouldn't like set out to make a five year game, for instance. I I would say, if you want to make something fun, what is the fun thing you want to make? I right. something that you can achieve that you can do, and like I there's no excuse for not finishing a game right now when people are finishing games and weekends, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if you've never made a game, take this weekend and make a game. Do that. Uh, just do it. Yeah. Just like puzzle script people do it all the time <laughs> like or like uh, uh unreal engine sorry i just remembered where i was <laughs> yeah just <laughs> do this <laughs> I, I say puzzle script because it's like a little in browser thing but like or you know like if you want to make it a little experience make a little experience right. find something fun yeah and there's i mean there's a ton of mod kits on our launcher that people can download and and plug away in and make their own you know make the adventure that they would want to play right exactly yeah, yeah. Start small, make a thing that's fun, yeah. and roll from there. That's what yeah. it kind of sounds like. Yeah. Well, I think that's what we've got for today. Awesome. This was awesome. fun. This was yeah, great. Yeah, you're <laughs> awesome. So much. Yeah. Yeah. It's super awesome to have you here. 
hey that thanks is looking for having... incredible i'm really excited uh when i launch can i come back maybe maybe, maybe we can work something out <laughs> but no it's i think there's a been a lot of you know a lot of our guests tend to be our own developers which are great and that's one perspective but it's really nice to show you know especially right. as a solo developer making your own game kind mm -hmm. of an alternate pr approach and perspectives to solving problems that like we have larger teams and don't need as many people to solve those problems so by mm -hmm. having yeah. you know it's like i don't know how many animators we yeah. have but it's like you're all of those roles you're wearing all of those hats and so how to approach those problems as yeah. an individual and you can you've clearly come so far even mm -hmm. you know in just blueprints building yeah. and learning mm -hmm. all these systems by yourself without you know yeah. like you definitely learn like uh You'll never be the smartest one in the room again when you're, because uh, you you're the worst at when you're a journalist. You're the worst at everything. You, know? you can do everything. But you can do everything. You can do everything. <laughs> but only like, the, you know, not to the degree of somebody who does that specific thing every day. But you have a thing that you're making, right? And that's, that's and I think that's also key. Is like a lot of people get hung up on what to do or where to go or or it's like in a system. And it's like just make a thing, create something, and then you get a feel for the whole process. And I feel like once you've, even if it's a small experience over a weekend like you've built something from start to finish you know what that process looks like and then the next time you iterate or build a new game you can take all of those lessons learned and you'll do it better the next time absolutely yeah. and so i think there was a harvard study at one point where they had um some people were graded on how many widgets they'd make and some people were graded on how oh it was vases some people were graded on how I many vases this, they yeah. could make and some people were graded on um half the class was told they would be graded on how perfect their vases were and in the end, the team that was graded based on how many vases they made, made more perfect vases. Yeah. Because they just cranked them out and they just got practice and they just got better and better at it. Mm -hmm. Whereas the people who spent forever fussing about like um, one vase on one vase, they actually didn't make the best possible vase. Mm -hmm. I think there's probably a, a middle ground there somewhere, but yeah. Um, but keep doing stuff and that's where you'll... Yeah. The key to that, that was there was a deadline. Right. Yes. There was an end date. Yeah. 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 So no. make a game. And if, you, if you have more questions, you can always hit me up. I do stream Unreal Development. Somebody we'll actually just linked your. Aww. Oh, somebody also beat me to it. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So we just linked Kine on Steam, mm -hmm. and somebody linked to uh, your Twitch channel. Yep. So you guys make sure you follow Gwen on social media. Check out the the project. I think you can add it to your wish list on Steam, right? Yeah, yeah, that'd yeah. be that'd be doing me a favor. Do you have a target time. release date? Uh, it's gonna be next year. I don't know exactly when yet. Okay, twenty nineteen. Twenty nineteen. Yeah. That's a you, wide range, but you know, it's only but it's still a deadline. Days. Yeah, yeah. There's still. It's before twenty twenty. It is. Right. That we know that much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, so it's again, it's absolutely wonderful having you join us. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks Super again for coming back, stuff. Jay. Yeah. Thanks, we Jay. always love having you on the stream with us. A um, couple notes for you all. We've dropped a survey in the chat. So let us know how we're doing, how you like the stream, what kinds of topics would you like us to cover in the future. That always helps us know what you would just like to learn. And that's important for us. Um, always check for your local UE4 meetups, meetup.com slash pro slash Unreal Engine. Hopefully there's some great folks in your area meeting up. It's always beneficial, I feel like, to have a community and Show people your game early and often, or learn from them. And if there's not, you can always start one. Um, as far as our community spotlight, you saw earlier today, we had three awesome games. We're often checking the forums, the work in progress or release projects sections. So that's a great way for us to discover your games and show them to everybody else. You want to talk about the countdown? Of course I don't. <laughs> uh, so every week we start our stream with a five-minute countdown, uh, and we love seeing it. It's, it's awesome to watch the... The, the speed dev you're doing. So if anybody out there wants to be potentially uh, spotlighted or highlighted on the on the stream, make a 30 minute to an hour live stream or recording, compress it into five minutes, send it to us at community at unrealengine.com. Send us a short description of your project as well as a PNG of your logo. And then watch our stream every Thursday. You may see it. Yeah. And that's it. Those things. And follow then, us on social. Yeah. Did follow us to all the socials. The Twitters, the Facebooks. Instagrams. Instagram. Mm -hmm. And YouTube, MySpace. Mm, what else? That's too many. Is it? But Are then, yep. Keep track of Gwen uh, Dire Goldfish. That's Twitch and Twitter, right? Correct. Yeah. Dire Goldfish. So, again, great to have you. We will see you all next week with our epic Mega Jam results. All right. All right see you Bye. all Take next care, guys. week. Bye.